I, I want to move to the 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 policies uh, and, and the understanding as far as the society at that point in time is concerned. Uh, where would this country be if, let's say, Netaji was alive socially? Now, one of the important aspects that you have talked about in a lot of articles that you've written is with respect to Netaji's opinion on women and the power that they should enjoy in the political structure. In fact, at one point, he wrote that the country cannot move forward if the women do not move forward. He, exactly. so far, he, you know, he goes so far as to say that women should be less taught self-defense and he I remember I think you've also talked about he how he once stood up in the Albert Hall and he called out the bestiality of the Indian men I want you to talk a little bit about where, where and how did Netaji stand as far as a uh, position of women in society is concerned and how different would it be had he been alive uh, well again <clears throat> he came from Bengal so that helped him uh, in some kind uh, uh, with his uh, mindset, uh, where there was a very strong tradition of Shakti Puja. So, uh, and, and because of his spiritual orientation from the very childhood, uh, and he, he learned to worship Shakti, work, learned to worship women as forms of power, as, as the manifestations of power. And uh, he was a bit different from the standard uh, fair, like the uh, normal kids are, or normal uh, teenagers are, normal youth are, in the sense that he had completely taken a vow of uh, Brahmachan. And probably he, he, he always cherished in, his, in some corner of his mind the idea of taking sannyas. So for him, women were always a form and symbol of power. And when he, whenever he saw, uh, the, the, the torture on women or the suppression of women in any form, he, he, he reacted very strongly over that. And uh, this, this happened with, uh, he also got a sense of this from his political mentor, this was the Chitrangandas, who, took a, who played a very big role in uh, rescuing uh, kidnapped women and destitute women. He, he, he was a very, very large-hearted and sympathetic man who would fight with his contemporaries to make safe place for women, to ensure their safety. But Subhas was, again, uh, learning this from his uh, guru, from his mentor, but taking it uh, further. And when he joined uh, politics and got involved with the revolutionary groups, many of these small revolutionary groups had very active uh, women members. And uh, the, I have named a few, like there was uh, the daughter of Suvas's uh, uh, childhood teacher in the school, Beni Mahatam Das, his daughter Bina Das. Uh, she became a revolutionary and uh, she went and fired at the governor of uh, Bengal in the Calcutta University Convocation Hall, Stanley Jackson. She opened fire and, and her, her uh, speech in her defense is still considered a classic. So Bina Das was younger than him, but Bina Das looked up to Subhas as, a, as an elder brother. And Subhas was a source of inspiration for her. Then there were women like Leela Roy, uh, uh, Leela Nag before marriage, who came from Dhaka, the first uh, woman the student of the Dhaka University, who taught the university uh, and uh, established girls' uh, schools and colleges. She walked shoulder to shoulder with Subhas during the rescue uh, operations in the, the terrible 1923 North Bengal flood. So women like this were constantly working with Subhas as his colleagues. And, and he was perfectly okay and happy about that. And he, in fact, wanted more and more women to join the revolutionary movement, to join the Congress. In 1928, uh, the volunteer corps uh, that he sets up to conduct the uh, Calcutta Congress in 1928, December, a uh, large part of it was only women's corps. So they were formed of only women trained in drilling. The, he wanted them to carry daggers, but the police did not permit. Uh, the police uh, refused permission. So they couldn't carry daggers. So, and this idea was finally taken, given its final shape in the form of the Rani of Jhansi regiment. And uh, I mean, the instance which, uh, the, the example which you cited, his speech in uh, the Albert Hall in uh, Calcutta, that was while he was president of Congress in 1938. And uh, this was a meeting where, uh, uh, I mean, it was convened to condemn the torture on women. 
and uh, Subhas didn't like to uh, faff around. He didn't waffle. He he was very plain spoken, and that is that was another key difference. With I will come to it later a little bit more. That there was a difference in the language of politics of Subhas Bose and the Gandhian wing. There was a lot of circumlocution and waffling when if you look at the Gandhian political program and compare it with uh, Subhas. So Subhas stands up and says very clearly that I mean, uh, I mean I have seen very few. Uh, countries where such a large proportion of men are uh, bestial and lustful, and 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 then you claim yourself to have a spiritual heritage, you should be ashamed of yourself. I mean, why should women have uh, reserve seats? Why do they even need to have reserve seats in uh, public transport? If you if you are civilized enough, women don't need uh, reserve seats. And uh, he said, I don't uh, advocate uh, flogging. I I don't support flogging. But in this case, in case of harassing women, torturing women, ill teasing, I am perfectly all right with any person who does that being publicly flogged. And uh, besides other punishment. And then he makes this case of women have to learn self defense. They, they need to be able to defend themselves and not uh, be shy in their public life, not as if they are getting tangled in their feet, in their dress, and not able to look eye to eye uh, with. Any person that they're talking about. So he had a very, very modern outlook. It was partly out of his spiritual uh, upbringing, partly out of his very liberal up upbringing in his family, where women played a very dominant role. And uh, uh, there, uh, I, uh, we don't find. I mean, I have given the comparison, uh, the contrast with the Gandhian emphasis on purity of women. That if uh, men yes. are women are pure, then I there nobody can cross them. Yeah, and that's where it gets more interesting. You know, I, I was reading about that and that, 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 made, that was surprising to me as a young person. Uh, Gandhi talks about purity of women and, and you, you write yourself that he says, if a woman is pure, no evil eye will be able to hold her or confine her. But right. at the same time, you have a contrast here of Bose who says, you know, purity is not enough. You'll need to know how to defend yourself. And, and that's a stark irony, sir. And to a young woman who's reading about it now, I did not even know that 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 such were the opinions held of women back then. Exactly. And and that was that is what uh, uh, what what Gandhiji actually uh, wrote that women find it much women find it much easier to die than men. And uh, if if by purity she cannot cast off the evil eyes, uh, then uh, she should rather die. I mean, she should rather die before uh, uh, something bad is done to her. So that's, that's a very uh, medieval, I won't even say medieval, probably that's a prehistoric and uh, amazing sort of view. And uh, she, he, he went on to write about women, modern women that they paint themselves and probably they want uh, half a dozen Romeos around her and all. And, uh, and a group of uh, 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 women from Calcutta found it very, very objectionable and they wrote a very strongly worded letter to him saying that, I mean, we are shocked to hear something from you, uh, you who depend routinely in your political activities, in your other activities, depending on uh, uh, women and you, you look at them with such uh, contemptuous uh, views. So, uh, and the, you, again, the, as I said, circumlocution and uh, never being to the point was uh, a uniqueness of Gandhian uh, language. So he could all he could easily very very easily shift his position whenever charged or cornered about something. So he would he would always keep the escape route open and say that no, I didn't mean that. What I said is this, and then go on to open about that. So uh, that 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 that's again what makes Subhash very endearing to the current generation, to the younger generation, that they like plain speaking that they like to the point uh, uh, unpretentious talk and speak your mind. And, and it, the added advantage is the high ideals that a man, man like Subhash Bose represents. So there's a very big contrast there in, in terms of modernity, in terms of uh, mental outlook, in terms of uh, political program, in terms of spirituality. Uh, so the, Suhas and Gandhiji, or despite Suhas's respect for him as an individual, uh, there probably couldn't have been two more different persons than they were, Suhas and Gandhi. Nehru fell somewhere in between and Nehru chose to be with Gandhi. 
that was the tragedy of india in my opinion right i i want to shift focus now to uh, religious opinions of of netaji and and how 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 did bors envision india to be uh, did he envision india to be a hindu nationalistic country or or a hindu nation or was he more liberal in his approach because you know you you've written somewhere and and you talk about how uh, as far as savarkar's role is concerned you says that although they hold very strong uh, you know opinions against each other when it comes to politics of uh, vinay damodar savarkar and the hindu mahasabha however mm -hmm. you say that he wasn't anti savarkar that he wasn't anti savarkar in fact it was more nuanced can you elaborate on that please yeah uh, let me let me clarify on the point of savarkar uh, uh, i didn't say that he was not anti savarkar he was uh, completely against the political program of savarkar and he criticized savarkar's political program in very strong language but at the same time he saw savarkar uh, in in totality in a, in a, a very holistic manner savarkar uh, was not born in 1947 savarkar's political life goes back much further and uh, his uh, days as a revolutionary the amount of torture and persecution he had gone through the his thinking his uh, capability of thinking as a thinker suhas had great respect for that uh, there is no doubt about it he was at the same time extremely unhappy about savarkar savarkar being fixated with uh, which he wrote in his own book that uh, savarkar is not ready to do anything for india he does not have any idea about global politics he is fixated with his uh, idea of uh, admitting enrolling hindus in the british indian army with the sole aim of training them uh, militarily so he found that very ridiculous and he uh, criticized it as strongly as possible but at the same time uh, i have written in one of my articles i have written it in the book also that uh, suhas's political uh, mouthpiece uh, which was also called the forward block his party was called forward block his mouthpiece was also called forward block so there was an article which analyzed savarkar i mean savarkar was thoroughly criticized his political his speeches were mercilessly criticized but then there was a very sympathetic uh, long article analytical article showing the i mean calling savarkar uh, a, a, a brilliant revolutionary a brilliant thinker and all and then it lamented that because of the extremist islamic politics savarkar uh, has chosen the wrong path he has been too influenced by the extremist islamic uh, politics and uh, instead of joining the congress uh, when savarkar was released from the uh, british prohibition of being in public life suhas had welcomed him and expressed desire that savarkar should join congress uh, savarkar joined hindu mahasabha and uh, followed that line of politics uh, suhas was naturally not very happy with it but he never lost respect for the man that savarkar was so there were differences and he went and met savarkar in 1940 Uh, to bring him back into the mainstream to make him a part of the resistance that he was trying to build up against uh, the british raj uh, the final push that he was planning in 1940 that uh, bring together all revolutionary societies bring together all non gandhian non congress uh, political groups and then at a single point of time start a mass uprising across the country uh uh satyagraha or a civil disobedience call give whatever name you want so he wanted savarkar to be a part of it and he was extremely disappointed that savarkar refused to understand his point of view savarkar refused to understand his point of view and so was failed to understand savarkar's politics so he criticized savarkar but at the same time he had great respect for savarkar as an individual as a political worker and as a thinker savarkar returned the same feelings savarkar never criticized suhas in he criticized suhas's politics of course he did but when suhas left india and uh, savarkar wished him the best he said that uh, as a son of mother india let him be strong enough to achieve the goal he has set out for and hence, hence forward even till the end of his life savarkar always mentioned suhas was as one of the factors that catalyzed the exit of the british raj uh, which savarkar did not give that credit to anybody else in the congress 
he always specified and singled out Subhash Bose. So that is what I have uh, highlighted that yeah. they were politically very different, but again, it was very nuanced. Okay. So so just just to come back to that. So what I mentioned is that you say the Bose wasn't anti savarkar Was he was he wasn't anti savarkar Is what you continue to maintain? Individually, he, politically, he was. Okay. So politically, politically, they had different point of views, but Absolutely. as far as individuals is concerned, they had huge respect for each other and their work. Yeah, there was no meeting ground, politically speaking. So, uh, and Bose was a very uh, stringent critic of Savarkar. So politically, there was. But there are two sides. That's what I said. Politics is one aspect of it. Individually, personally, there is another uh, aspect of it. So that's there. And uh, the other point you mentioned about Bose's points on uh, religion. Yes. And uh, is uh, uh, Bose was a very you know, curious mix of a secular individual in the sense that he said he he took a, a position which said that uh, to uh, marginalize or to persecute any religious group in our country is against God's law. So every religious community should have complete freedom to follow their own path. And at the same time, he advocated that uh, the, the, the cultural intimacy, the different religious groups should try to know more about uh, each other. He, he was worried, what worried him was that uh, religious exclusivity. He said that the Hindus don't know much about Islam. The Muslims don't know much about the Hindu cultural uh, practices, religious practices, the Christians, the Parsis, they're all living in pockets. That should go. Each group should try to know each other far better so that even in terms, even when there are conflicts, when there are disagreements, they can be settled amicably. <clears throat> so that was his uh, ideal. And that is exactly what he practiced when he created the Azadin government in Japan or the Indian Legion in Germany. But having said that, Suhas was also the kind of secular who wouldn't be shy of uh, showing him publicly as a very proud and devout Hindu. So he wouldn't advertise his Hinduness, uh, but when, it, when the opportunity presented itself, he would stand up in, uh, in, in defense of Hinduism. So uh, in Mandala Jail uh, in 26, 1925-26, uh, we find that Suhas is organizing the uh, revolutionaries uh, imprisoned there uh, against the Burmese and the Bengal government who had refused to pay allowances for Durga Puja and Saraswati Puja. So he writes uh, a very uh, in a very deep letter to the governor, say, talking about the European argument against the European model of secularism. He says, "Your secularism has uh, ha has drained out." the sense of spirituality out of your races. So you don't know what it means to be spiritual and religious. We Indians, religion means the life breath. And uh, it, it, it is not just a show, it is not just a festival. It means much more to us in our daily lives. So we, till the last breath, we will defend our religious rights. You cannot uh, uh, take away our religious rights. And the same thing again happens later in 1929, 1930, when he organizes Durga Puja in the Ali Puja in Kolkata. So the government doesn't give him permission, doesn't give law funds, and he goes on to hunger strike, and finally he does the uh, puja. So whenever public, and then another instance I would give where he had a uh, uh, conflict with uh, uh, Ravindranath Tagore. Ravindranath Tagore was uh, from the Brahma community, and uh, in one of the Brahma hostels uh, in, in, uh, in Kolkata, college, it was called the city college, which was a Brahmo institution. Uh, the Hindu students in the hostel who were numerically superior, they wanted to do Saraswati Puja. And the hostel authorities and the college authorities prohibited them from doing so. So what stood by the, uh, by the students? They said that the students should have the religious liberty to follow their own religion. Why should they be prohibited from uh, doing their own uh, uh, festival? So he took a public stance he allowed freedom for all religious groups. And for him, the, the nation building was so, so far more important that these issues were at the background. 
but he wouldn't compromise there also. So he had, and, and, and he wanted Hinduism probably as a proselytizing religion. That's, that's very uh, uh, unlike of a man like Subhash. So, he, so you cannot, as I said, you cannot fit him into a box of any ism. So he was not a secular in the current uh, mode of uh, political discourse that we have today. I mean, someone who is secular today is almost scared of calling himself or herself a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian. He is a secular or she is a secular. So our individual secular, I don't know what that means, but uh, I mean, a, possibly just a faithless person. But Subhas was very proud of his uh, faith, his system of faith. And he was not a theoretical uh, a spiritualist. He was somebody who had taken to the uh, practice of uh, religion, religion, which is sadhana, uh, from the very early age. And we see him uh, getting into Tantri Sadhana in Mandala Jail. It was, a, it was a very unique feature which we see repeated uh, all the 11 times that he was in prison. And all his inmates have uh, uh, vouched for it that wherever he was located, in his cell, there would always be a corner which he would cover with curtains. That was his puja space. And nobody had access to that. That was his individual, absolutely private space. So he was a practicing uh, uh, sadhak. You, as you might say, even during the World War, Second World War, when he is leading the fight, the war, a government, he would take out time, uh, one hour or a couple of hours, go to the uh, Ramakrishna mission in Singapore, meditate there for one hour, two hours, and then come back. In, in his saffron robes, he would do this thing. And not a single person of uh, his government or his uh, army had a problem with that. And mind you, that the topmost uh, army generals uh, in the INA and in the government were non-Hindus. Most of them, uh, SAIR was a Christian. Uh, 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 the, the chief of army staff was a uh, Muslim. The, the, the chief of staff was uh, a Sikh. So, uh, and, and you will find these people absolutely ready to throw away their lives at one single command of Metaji. So. He was a secular in, in the truest sense. He, he had a deep belief and faith in his own religion, would not impose that on anyone, allow others to follow their uh, religious path and try to bring everybody together. And that was his vision that he executed in the INA and the other in the And probably would have done so for example. Okay, so, so to all those... Uh extreme right wing at this point in time who, who, who consider Netaji to be their chair leader would be disappointed therefore to know that he was a secular and did not, although he carried his religion on his sleeves, but did not really, there is no academic evidence if I'm, if I'm understanding this correct, there is no academic evidence to suggest that he would be a supporter of Hindu Rashtra. Uh, uh, no, I mean not in that sense, but uh, it is also uh, not probably right to uh, judge retrospectively, because uh, by by putting by looking at him through the filter of uh, the discourse in 2022, we are judging him. We are judging a man who was living and acting in 1945. So obviously, the situation was very different there, and uh, very. Different. But as I said, I mean, even in 1945, he was so far ahead of his time because. His vision was an Indian nation where uh, different ethnicities, different communities would come together. Again, I, I mean, I like to reiterate and uh, I mean, reinforce this again and again, that he saw India's mission to lead the world in bringing together diverse communities and ethnicities and religious groups and who can live harmoniously and present an example to the world. In, in the world of strife, I think that is a thought uh, which, which uh, articulated in 1928 was far, far ahead of its times. So, but politics may have changed since then, but the social fabric hasn't, has it? Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, just just to understand, you're right that it 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 would not be correct for us to make judgments at this point in time. We are far, far more um, into the future, but the social fabric remains the same. We still have the uh, challenges have changed. Yes, the nature of challenges have changed. The mm -hmm. nature of uh, uh, political discourse, the nature of communal conflict, these have changed. I mean, communal conflict. Uh, for example, the biggest communal conflict in Calcutta, for example 
1926 was over uh, the passing of a procession which played music in front of a mosque. Today, we are talking about uh, a properly organized global movement of terrorism, sleeper cells, uh, 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 and, and a political ideology in the garb of religion trying to occupy uh, uh, territory or the population or people's mind. There are uh, globally funded uh, conversion uh, initiatives. The, the, these things and the reaction to these from uh, the people who feel that they are being at the receiving end, these have changed the kind of discourse that we are having today. And uh, but I agree with you here at one point that at the core, the values, the core values have not changed. The core values should remain same. And the core value that was there in 1945, I believe the core values should be the same even now. If the dream was to uh, live uh, harmoniously and with love, uh, in, uh, I mean, whatever the way of working it out, so has had his own views and his world world view was very very specific and uh, not vague. There is no reason why we shouldn't have why you should lose that value. Yes. So that value, the core value, should be the same. Yes, and 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 given the fact as as you've mentioned again and again, um, and now we have it solid clear in our minds that unlike unlike Jawaharlal Nehru, he was very clear on what he wanted and he would not change easily. He, he, was, yeah. he was firm and clear and would not change, would not let others affect his political ideology and his social ideology, right? He was ready to learn, but he was always uh, very uh, uh, wary of the fact and uh, in his broadcast from Germany and Japan, one thing was uh, a permanent feature that he was warning the Indians all the time to his listeners that don't let uh, Jawaharlal Nehru and Mahatma Gandhi enter into a compromise with the British government because this, they begin a campaign in a very nice way, particularly Mahatma Gandhi begins in a brilliant fashion, takes it up to the peak of it and then somehow loses now and looks for compromise. So don't let them compromise. Okay. Okay. Now that you mentioned J Japan and Germany, what do you make of his collaboration with the fascists and the Nazis? Because you know we we've seen pictures, sir, and and that's where Bose continues to be divisive. Bose continues uh, to have followers, ardent followers as well as haters, because he reluct he he did not he was reluctant to criticize the worst excesses on Jews, the German anti-Semitism, he did not at any point of time come out and openly say, no, I do not support them. So what do you make of the collaboration with the, you know, the Nazis in Germany and the fascists in Japan? Uh, well, one thing we have to understand is that uh, we, we should remember when we are discussing and debating this issue in 2022, is that uh, Subhas was not an administrator of a Facebook page or a YouTube channel. So he, he, was, he was not pontificating, he was not in charge of pontificating or uh, moralizing. He uh, was a leader of a national movement whose sole objective at that time was to win freedom for India. And for that, it meant working in uh, whatever way that, that served India's interests and nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. So uh, in his speech uh, as a Congress president in 1938, he made one simple point which evaded the attention of many leaders at that time. Uh, some very shrewd and uh, attentive leaders like uh, Kripalani noted it, uh, but the meaning became very clear to the other leaders later on, where he said that it is none of our business what is happening inside other countries. Our objective is solely to win freedom for India. What any country is doing within its own boundaries is its own problem, and we are in no position to interfere there. So that, that was his stated position. And he clarified it in 1939, uh, saying that uh, India should think of her interests first. And when I say that Subhas was, was far ahead of his time, uh, it's not an exaggeration. Because this uh, statement 
that India should think of her interests first, uh, re-emerged as the election campaign in 2030, when Prime Minister, led to be Prime Minister Modi and then Chief Minister came up with the slogan, India first. So that slogan, which was relevant in 1939 and which people failed to understand, uh, was uh, relevant in 2013 also. So uh, let me, I mean, in terms of his views towards uh, Germany, I will very quickly write, uh, read up a letter, a couple of lines from a letter he, he wrote to uh, the head of the German Academy in 1934 uh, to uh, someone called uh, Theofilder. Now, uh, Franz Theofilder, he writes, I regret that I have to return to India with the conviction that the new nationalism of Germany is not only narrow and selfish, but arrogant. Apart from this new racial philosophy and selfish nationalism, there is another factor which affects us even more. Germany, in her desire to carry favor of Great Britain, finds it convenient to attack India and the Indian people. I am still prepared to work for an understanding between Germany and India. This understanding must be consistent with our national self-respect. So this is uh, this letter was actually the culmination of Suvas's stay in Europe, largely uh, in and around uh, Vienna and Berlin, Czechoslovakia. So there he got attracted by the uh, uh, quasi uh, military movements and the forces. And what attracted him was a sense of uh, self-respect a sense of a sense of nation, nationhood, and the sense of discipline. So, and he thought these qualities were very, very desirable, and had to be brought into the Indian public, into their consciousness. So, he he tried to work out with those organizations in a way that the values could be uh, transferred in some ways to the political discourse in India. Uh, there were other things that he was interested in, like municipal governance and all. I'm not going into that now. But what he did in a major way was that uh, he stood by the Indian students and guided them in Rome, in Berlin, in Czechoslovakia, wherever he found them persecuted because of the skin color, because of their being Indians. He represented them to the respective governments, wrote petitions for them, wrote news in the newspaper articles and letters and condemned the government policies. So he was very, very uh, vocal about it. It was not that he was uh, having some sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, hide and seek over, over this thing. He was not trying to present himself as a good man to them. He was, if he, if he thought, as I said, that he was known for his plain, plain speaking. So if he thought it was bad, he made it very, very clear publicly that I am not happy with what you are doing and your laws need to change, your attitude towards Indians need to be changed. As far as Jews are concerned, he had great respect for the Jews as a race and uh, his sensitivity, there are not many documents available about on this. And uh, the story of his attitude and mentality towards the Jews comes from a Jewish uh, uh, professor herself a Jewish professor who was living in Berlin at that time and happened to chance upon him and was so mesmerized by Suvash, uh, she and her husband. Uh, and uh, Suvash advised them to leave Berlin and uh, move over to, uh, to the US. So they went and settled in the US. Many years later, she wrote uh, a book which uh, of her recollections of Suvash. And one has to read that book to actually feel how uh, humane and sensitive as a person Suvash was. And they had, obviously, they had arguments. And they challenged Suvash that you are trying to uh, get help from the German government, but th they are monsters and they are persecuting the Jews and torturing everywhere. Uh, Suvash said, of course, I know that and, and I don't support it. But what can I do? Am I going to uh, lecture them what they should and what they should not do in their country? Why would they listen to me? And is that my priority right now? When the British are doing the same thing, exactly the same thing that the Germans are doing to you. The British are doing the exact same thing to my millions of countrymen. So I have to uh, uh, rectify that thing first. There lies my responsibility. And 
once that is done then i can think of world problems like this but this is not my place this is not my job this is not uh, my time to talk about it or create a campaign about it so it was all very well uh, with uh, uh, gandhi ji or jawahar lal nehru or even or even uh, rabindranath tagore to uh, criticize uh, and be critical remain critical and take a side against the germans uh, because their world views or their political views were different so was was planning something different so he was working like a true uh, global diplomat i mean uh, if if you look at uh, all the western liberal democracies today uh, particularly the, i mean the, the countries which are the source of these kind of criticisms which claim to be the flag bearers of democracy and liberal humanitarian values uh, and they are the ones who have given rise to the jihadists to the uh, mujahideens uh, where, where where we find uh, uk supporting saudi arabia to be a member of the un uh, human rights council so i mean um, why why would they do that they would do that only because it serves their self interest and self interest national interest is a sole uh, guiding principle of global politics of geopolitics and that is exactly what suhas was was doing he was not uh, moralizing and even when he was there in germany when he went to germany first thing let me make another point clear that uh, when suhas left india in 1941 he had no plans to go to germany or it he had been preparing his escape plan for the last one year and all the routes that were being considered all his revolutionary secret network that had been mobilized everybody was working to create an escape plan to soviet russia when so was reached kabul in january uh, or february uh, 1941 it was then that the soviet government told him that he couldn't go to moscow or moscow wouldn't take him in at that moment suhas had two options either he should go to another country or he should come back to kolkata so anybody who's uh, raising questions first thing he or she should do is to place himself or herself in the shoes of suhas bos outside the uh, soviet embassy in kabul standing in knee deep snow after waiting for 7 days and being refused entry so that that's when the, they approached the german and the italians and uh, they were ready to take suhas in and uh, he went along with them and even when he reached uh, germany and italy uh, in germany he never gave his allegiance to hitler's plans or activities so when even after being refused by the soviet union even after being refused entry by the soviet union when germany attacked uh the soviet union he uh, criticized the german government in his letter to the foreign minister ribbentrop to not to anybody else to ribbentrop in the strongest language he said that the whole of india is going to turn against you because what you have done is a blunder and this does not make any sense and people in india see soviet union as a benefactor as a friend and now you have attacked them so he was again he was criticizing the policies on the on their face he uh, when he's meeting soldier is uh, sorry when he was meeting hitler in and hitler starts lecturing him uh, one of the interpreters later recounted that he spoke in english he said in english that please tell your excellency that i have been in politics all my life and he does not need to lecture and the interpreter was so scared that he he refused to interpret that line for it so that that remained uh, unmitigated um, this came from one of the interpreters present in the room so he was that kind of man and, and when he ultimately comes to japan uh, uh, the japanese ambassador and hitler has a meeting to discuss what suvas bos is doing in south east asia and uh, the japanese ambassador sends a report of this meeting the minutes of the meeting to tokyo now by the time the allies had already broken the cipher code being used by the axis powers so this uh, telegram is intercepted and it goes to australia uh, and and, and they, they read it so we found it from the australian archives then the Jap- japanese ambassador is telling hitler that uh, Jap- the, the japanese government 
has given Subhash Bose a blank check in terms of his plans and everything. So Subhash Bose, wherever he went, he went on with his own plans and ideas. He was nobody's man. He was not playing to anybody's ideas or guidance or dicta. Rather, I mean, even when he, well, the first time he reached Tokyo and wanted to meet Tojo, Prime Minister Tojo, uh, uh, Prime Minister Tojo was very busy. The war was going on. There was no reason he should meet someone like uh, Subhash Bose. But, but uh, due to the pressure of his cabinet and other military leaders, Tojo agrees to meet Subhash Bose for a few minutes. And when he meets Subhas Bose for a few minutes, that few minutes extends to a few hours. And by the end of the meeting, he is so impressed that Subhas Bose asks him that I want your unconditional support. So there will be no strings attached. I am not promising you back anything. I am not going to give you anything, not on, on, on my behalf, not on India's behalf. So are you going to help? Are you ready to help? And Tosho promises, instantly promises, gives his promise that he will help unconditionally. So that was the force of his personality. That was the force of his ideas he could convince he could communicate and he was nobody's man so ideologically speaking before going to japan in 1937 he had written a long article criticizing japan because of its atrocities in china so ideologically he was with none of those axis powers but those axis powers were helping him in his struggle to free india so obviously he was not going to uh, pretend that he didn't need them and he was not uh, thankful for their help. Of course, he was grateful for their help. Nobody else was helping India at that time. And the Japanese and the Axis powers were doing them every bit. The Japanese, the German government didn't expect anything in return. But they were pouring money. They were investing in uh, manpower. They, and, and funny thing is the German foreign office set up, which was helping Suhas, bulk of them were anti-Hitler resistance force people. Uh, but the German foreign ministry were funding them. So why would they do that? I mean, there was no obvious return from Suhas. He was not talking about fascism. He was not singing pants for Hitler or uh, Mussolini or Tojo. Of course, he was thanking them uh, uh, wherever he could because of the help. And he should have. And anybody should have. Right. But that's global policy. That's geopolitics. Okay. Very interestingly. As you pointed out, he was nobody's man. So although he was visiting all these countries out of necessity and he was impressing them with his caliber, his, his ability to you know, change discourse, but at the same time, he was not supporting any of these fascist or the Nazi regimes. But you know, you know, coming, coming to the end of it, and we've already overshot our time, but I, I want to end with one fundamental question about Netaji on everybody's mind. And that is with regards to his death. Death remains mystery. What have you discovered through your book and through your uh, the archives that you've dug into for the research of this book? What exactly happened? Well, the question what happened to Netaji was probably the biggest India's modern India's biggest political mystery. And uh, I mean, standing today, I can confidently say that we have an answer to the question. And with enough strong evidence, all sorts of evidence, eyewitness accounts, documentary evidence forensic evidence, uh, we have uh, proved that he came back to India in the early 1950s and uh, uh, lived here till the last moment, till the moment of his death in 1985, 15th September. That was the end of him. So can we now say for sure that he did not die as people presume him to have died? He died no on the Indian soil? Absolutely. And and can can you please... Uh, you know, just, just as a curious listener here, what sort of evidence do we have to suggest that? Uh, uh, numerous source, uh, evidences from numerous sources, not one evidence from one particular source. Uh, we have collected sources from different sources, uh, evidences from coming from uh, his extensive revolutionary network, which he had before he left India. Uh, uh, the Anushilan Samiti leaders, uh, the leaders from uh, revolutionary groups like Sri Sangha, they all came together and came to this man to help him. Uh, there were uh, people from uh, uh, the Navajavan uh, uh, Samiti in uh, Uttar Pradesh. At least five chief ministers in UP were in touch with him. We have enough evidence to show that even the government of India, at least from the time of the uh, Bangladesh War, Liberation War, was in touch with him. And uh, they knew of his existence in India. 
even the current government knows, although they will not ever speak about it. And uh, we have uh, we had his handwriting examined through an independent expert, a top yeah, handwriting expert in the U.S., who had no idea who Subhash Bose was and who this person. Uh, we we set two sets of handwriting samples of this man called Gumnami Baba or Bhagwanji, who lived in Uttar Pradesh his last days, last years, and uh, of Netaji. Without knowing, having any background, he examined the uh, 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 handwritings. He follows the FBI methodology and gave a detailed uh, report showing that the handwritings match. To corroborate that finding, we independently got the handwriting samples tested by a top handwriting expert in India and without giving him the background. He also came to the same conclusion. Then the biggest obstacle was that the DNA was not matching. The DNA uh, extracted from the teeth of Gunnami Baba was not matching with Netaji's family members. So obviously that was the biggest obstacle because if DNA doesn't match, then the two persons cannot be same. There is no question. So we looked deeper into it and then we realized how very nicely a fraud was carried out, a forensic fraud was carried out in uh, government labs very very smoothly and uh, subtly so in uh, one uh, lab in hyderabad uh, they tested two teeth took out pulp and then they said that there is not enough dna available uh, but uh, and the results are incomplete and when we took their test results to independent experts across the world and in india top genetics uh, experts they looked at the results and said that of course i'm mean, the result test results are not complete but there is more matching here than non-matching. So if we have to take a, a call here, there is a match here rather than a non-match. So you can't call it inconclusive. It's, it's a subjective uh, call, whether you call it inclusive, conclusive or not. Mm -hmm. That being so, there was another set of DNA tests carried out by the Central Forensic Science Laboratory in Kolkata. Now, this is something splendid happened there. They gave a very categorical response that the DNA tests, uh, the DNA samples not not inconclusive as the other lab did, but the, this lab said the DNA results have not matched at all. So what we did, we said, please give us uh, the basic document on the basis of which you have reached the conclusion. That's called an electroperogram. So the DNA sample is uh, put in the machine. The machine reads the uh, genetic sequence, the uh, gene sequence, and prints it out in a chart, in the form of a chart. And the genetic experts will look at the chart and then they compare and match with it. Then they come to the conclusion. It's like a blood test report so, or, 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 or an ECG report or uh, an MRI report. You go to a doctor, you give them the report. They look at your report and they give their opinion. So we said, uh, where is that report? That report is missing. That report they won't give out. So th that is clear they are hiding something. But most astonishing part, most astonishing part, which beats all science, is that even before the test began in this lab, it was published in Calcutta's leading uh, Bengali daily. The results were published even before that test began. Six months before the test, were, the results were out, it was already published. The findings were already published. So, I mean, you call, uh, say, somebody like a uh, Lal Patina guy to your home, he comes to collect your blood sample and he comes along with your blood test report. It's, it's something like that. So without testing, when even the tests have not been started, the results are out and printed in the newspaper. Okay. So, so either they have to be, uh, I mean, they have some kind of time machine or they are, uh, they have some kind of supernatural power by which they can look into the future and then come back and write the report. So nothing explains this. So this, we expose this forensic fraud. So the handwriting matches, the DNA is more of a match than a non-match. Okay. So, but all these kinds. Then, then how, how are you attributing the, the day of the death? Because you were very precise. You said he died in a certain April of 1960. Because there are eyewitnesses. His followers who were there, the local followers, there were at least uh, 13 to 15 people who were there who have testified uh, in front of commissions and input commissions and all. And... Uh, uh, Based on their tes uh, testimonies, uh, that's the date we have got. And before us, uh, in 1985 itself, the local media uh, 
local media carried on their own investigations and uh, published their stories, their conclusions. Uh, I will just take one minute to tell you a fascinating coincidence. This is called irony of fate. When Suhas was forced to leave India, in the Indian media circle, who are very rabidly anti suhas was uh, the editor of a newspaper called Amrita Bazar Patri. Uh, and his name was Tushar Kanti Ghosh. And Tushar Kanti Ghosh made it his business to go after Suhas's life, to make his life miserable, to lampoon him, to criticize him, at the drop of a hat for every word he spoke. The same Tushar Kanti Ghosh was the editor of a newspaper, the, the news, the newspaper, which ran the longest uh, investigation on the so-called Gumdani Baba, and he saw the results. He commissioned the investigation. He saw the results. He accepted the results. So, same Tushar Kanti goes 1940 and 1985. So, that was another linking factor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, a couple of questions, sir. Before I conclude, um, so one of the one of the uh, people's wa people watching us, so uh, they asked, did Mukherjee Commission accepted a report of DNA te test on the teeth of uh, uh, Bhagbanji without seeing the report? Uh, is there any non-verbal evidence of the death of Bhagwanji in 1985? And did Dr. R. P. Mishra say in front of commission uh, that uh, Bhagwanji died in 1985 of September? These are very specific questions. I don't think they are very suitable for this kind, this okay. particular session. And uh, those uh, because this session is not on the mystery part or Gumnami <laughs> and Bhagwanji, I don't think I should get into that. Okay. Uh, maybe another time. Absolutely, sir. Thanks so much. I think it's it's been I think it's 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 been a lot of learning for me as as from a point of view of a journalist. I think I know something about history of this country, something about one of the uh, greatest men to have lived in on the Indian soil. And and thanks to you. Thank you for taking time and thank you for elaborating on those questions. I'm sure your followers and followers of Bose have a lot more uh, knowledge, idea, and understanding of. Bose's uh, political philosophy, his economic, uh, you know, philosophies, as well as his socio-political and geographical philosophies uh, during the course when he was alive, and of course the big mystery that you that you've unraveled for me, which I'm going to, I think, uh, sleep on, is the fact that as opposed to all that we knew, perhaps Bose did not really die in 1945, and I think that 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 is something of a of a great mystery. We, we have captured this entire thing in a book called Conundrum. Conundrum, Subhas Bush's Life After Death. Conundrum. It's co-authored by Anuj Dharani. So uh, yeah, if, you, if, you, if you like thrillers and mysteries, this is your book. Absolutely, sir. I, I think we're all going to sleep on that mystery. Thank you so very much for taking time. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you. Thanks.